Darkcast Network. Welcome to the Dark Side of Podcasts. Every 68 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. And every nine minutes, that victim is a child. Hey, everybody. This is Tiffany, the host of Crime Connections. And tonight I am here with my guest, Stephanie Jane, who is the author of Fear Not For You Are Redeemed. She talks about being a survivor of child sexual abuse and rape. And I really appreciate you being here with me tonight. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Of course. Where does your story begin? Well, I am a child. I'm a survivor of child sexual, mental and physical abuse. I grew up in a very abusive family. I can't remember a life without having abuse. Literally, Um, I was three years old when the sexual abuse started. So um, I grew up in that environment. You wouldn't think it's a normal environment. But when you grow up in that environment, it is a normal environment. Um, And I wasn't the only kid on the street. Um, I had my best friend on the right and the left went through the same exact type of childhood I did. So, um, you know, 25 percent of the women in the United States have been sexually assaulted. Everybody knows somebody, whether they're talking about it or not. So for me, it was it was the way I grew up. But there's a lot of emotional damage, a lot of psychological damage that takes place growing up like that. Everybody took me to church. We knew we we knew when to pray. We knew how to pray. We looked good out in the world, you know. We looked like a normal family. <laughs> you usually but, do, right? Yeah, we look normal, but um, you know, I didn't really learn about the Lord necessarily through church so much. But I love to read. So at the age of 12, I opened up my Bible and I read it cover to cover and I knew I needed to be saved by God's grace. I can't say that I was only 12 years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I didn't wake up the next morning being like, "Ooh, I'm going to live the Bible out. No, actually, things got a lot worse for me. I started to get into drugs and alcohol because that's the thing to do when you're that age, right? A little young, <laughs> a little young, you know, and I, I discovered very early that it was safe to hang out with the dangerous crowd because they were the ones to keep me safe. So if I was in that group, regardless of what they were doing, I was safe. So um, it's amazing to me what we will do in our own guard to try to keep ourselves safe. I mean, what, one person considers safe is not what somebody else is going to consider safe. I'm sure there was somebody that lives in a yuppie world somewhere else that was nowhere near where I was. And they were like, what are you doing? I was like, no, really, (laughs) this is the safe place to be. (laughs) When you live in the ghetto, guess what? (laughs) The hardest crowd is the best crowd to be in. (laughs) Nobody's going to mess with you. They don't mess with you. Nobody messes with you. Oh, you're with them. Okay, we'll leave you alone then. But, you know, I was very self-destructive in my teenage years. um, And I couldn't even process everything that had happened to me. And um, I kept reading my Bible, though. And I kept searching what the word had said. And interestingly, I would cry out to the Lord, like, change me. I want to do it different. I want to be somewhere different, but I didn't know how to get myself into a safe place. But the cool thing about the word is it's living and it's active. So the more we read it, the more time we spend in the word, God does change us little by little. And so I can look back and go, oh my goodness, growing up, I didn't know what real safety looked like. I read in the Bible what safety looked like, and that wasn't what I was living Um, it took years for me to really see how to like, I had the biggest attitude in the world and that's just how you are in the streets. Like you just, you have to, 
It's protection. Again, that's how you keep yourself safe. You don't let your guard down. And so I thought me with my little attitude was like, you know, I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. Don't be, don't be looking at me like that. Uh, uh-uh. You know, and over time, I'm like, I didn't do that so much. Over time, I started to go, well, what do you think about something? I started to let people in. And once I started to let people in, I really started to let my guard down and let people come into my world more so. You know, sexual abuse is very complicated. There's so many things that happen in your mind, especially when you grow up in an environment like that. When I tell you everybody in my family was abusive, it's it's literal. There was nowhere safe for me to go. Um, and even the places that I thought were safe, they weren't really that safe because I just didn't recognize what neglect looked like. I just thought it was normal. <laughs> Well, right. When you grow up that way and your friends are telling you it's happening in their home too, why are you supposed to think any different? Exactly. So, um, you know, the Lord slowly opens our eyes to what we're blind to. And I mean, I would not be here today doing what I do if it weren't for me just putting my trust in him. Because this world, you can't put your trust in. It's It'll hurt you. There's, you know, it's just, that's the reality of it. And, um, but God, you can trust and and God, you can put your faith and he's going to move you into the place that he wants you to be into. One of the wonderful things about Jesus is he gives us the, the desires of our heart, even when our heart doesn't really know what that looks like yet. You know, I wanted safety. I got married young and I thought that I thought being married being a stay-at-home mom, and we looked so perfect again on the outside. And I thought that was, again, another safe place for me to be. But he became an alcoholic, and as alcohol does to a person, it completely changed him. And he was no longer my safe place anymore. It wasn't, you know, I couldn't couldn't plan on, oh, we're going to go out and have a couple drinks. That wasn't a thing anymore. It's like, I better stay sober because God only knows what's going to happen tonight. You know, that's why. Been there. You know, it's it's complicated. So I think so many of us all we all want safety. You know, everybody wants safety. Men even want safety. That's why the military is so big. But it's impossible to have safety when we're looking at what the world can <laughs> offer for us. The world is never really going to make us safe because. There's, there's always going to be a terrorist that can come into any shopping mall. It doesn't matter where we go. It doesn't matter if you're in Brazil or if you're in America or if you're in Somalia. It doesn't matter where you go. We have the same stories in all of these different places. It might look a little bit different, but um, I really think that the only real safety there is is Jesus Christ. And when we come to him, he will give us our safe place. And sometimes it's only the hope that we have in him because we're not, we're not in great, great places. And that's, you know, walking through a divorce. Um, that's something, again, I had to be reminded of this stuff you see, is it your safety? Cause your safety net in, in the world can be pulled out from underneath you so fast and you will fly right on your butt. <laughs> like I'm back to square yep. one. Yep. (laughs) So, I mean, but God has a really, you know, he has a good sense of humor. I think the fact is like growing up, my motto was, and this is terrible motto. If anything bad can happen, it will happen to me. Let that sink in for a moment. That's terrible. That's a bad thing. And, and, And literally that's how I felt. I didn't put any, like, I didn't get excited about anything because I'd be like, oh, it's going to get screwed up anyway. So I kind of lived like that. I experienced so much from such a young age. I saw so much. I couldn't do, I'm an advocate for sexual assault survivors here in the Dallas area. I work with women that have been um, saved out of sex trafficking. And to listen to these women's stories they need to have somebody there that, that they're not, they're unfazed 
by whatever they're about ready to tell me. And I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of women come up to me and say, I've never told anybody this, but, and then they tell me their story of how they were sexually assaulted. I've had old ladies come up to me in their seventies and eighties year and still have never told anybody about what happened as a teenager. And I'm like, you know, why are you letting that control you? It's not controlling me. No, it is. Because who in your family do you suspect uncle whomever was touching? Oh, well, I really think it was my sister or I think it was my cousin. And you've never, after 55, 60 years, you've never went up to your sister and said, hey, this happened because of uncle so-and-so. You can't tell me you're not being suppressed somehow by that if you can't even come up to your sister, your sister, and say that. So there's just, there's such a stigma in our culture and it's worldwide of, you know, well, you shouldn't have wore that or, oh, you shouldn't have gone to that place and you should have known better those people you hang out with. That's sadly what people do to so many victims of sexual abuse is they try to blame the victim, which makes zero sense to me because if you're sleeping in your bed in the middle of the night and somebody came in and robbed you, everybody's going to come over to your house and be like, well, what are we missing? Let me help you. How can I help you? Do you need to make a meal train so everybody in the church can give you food for you the next week or two weeks? It's amazing to me how if certain crimes are committed against a person, you have your friends and family that want to come rally for you. But sexual assault is one of those things where people are just like, oh, I don't want to hear about that. I don't want to know about that, you know, and shame on you for being there. Shame on you for wearing that. It's like, why, why do we shame the victim in sexual abuse? That's not, that's not right. There's no reason for that, um, which is one reason that I am an advocate. It's one reason that I'm an author. I go into every place I can to share my story so that other women can hear, oh, it, she's talking about it and she's okay. And that must mean that I can talk to somebody about it. And if they can't find anybody, come talk to me. <laughs> my information's out there and I know how to get people connected to people. I love that as an advocate. I don't have everybody's solutions. I don't have everybody's answers, but I'll be like, I know somebody and let me connect you with that somebody. And if they don't know, they'll get you connected to the right person. So there is a lot of help out there, but we need more women coming forward. And I would say in the last five years, especially with the Me Too movement, which why did that get so much flack? There were too many people like, oh, well, we don't like the Me Too movement. Mm -mm. Even within the sexual abuse healing, there were a lot of people like, well, I don't want to be a part of that. It's like, well, there might have been a few things that came out of it. Because there were a few women that tried to smear somebody. And there's always there's always that one or two girls that just want to ruin it for everybody and lie. But for 99.9% .9 of the women out there, that was a big movement for them. To have celebrities, have their friends, just, just to hashtag me too. You know, just it happened to me. And we need to have that awareness so... Most people don't know 25% of the women have been sexually assaulted. They don't realize that they could probably sit down with three of their girls' friends and at least one of them has also gone through a similar experience. It's just, we need to get rid of that dark cloud as a, as a society. I don't care what your background is. Just for the human race, for our mental wellness, we all need to be able to say, you know, we, we have some compassion for what you went through. And so we need to be able to, as a society, embrace those people and love on them. Because, I mean, when you're sexually abused, power, you know, sexual abuse isn't about sex. Sexual abuse is about that person trying to take power over you. And interestingly enough, many victims feel powerless after the assault has happened so what better way to give them power back than to say, I want to hear you out. I want to listen to you. I want to validate what you're feeling. 
because when we are able to process what we're feeling, we can become empowered by what we are making a stand for. And so I just feel like it doesn't matter what our background is. I don't care if you're Indian or Muslim or Christian or you're agnostic or I don't care what it is. But as a society, we need to be able to embrace those people and not make victims feel shunned and shamed for what they went through. Eye Opening Moments Podcast are real life stories of adversity, encounters, and perspectives. They are moments that can lift your spirits, give you some food for thought, or move you. For the introspective mind that likes to reflect, discover, and find solutions or meaning in a complex life, listen to Eye Opening Moments Podcast. Oh, 110%. That's something that always really bothered me. Why are we always blaming the girl for what she what she was wearing or where she was that night or who she was hanging out with? That shouldn't matter because there's boundaries. Mm-hmm. And if I don't say that it's okay for you to touch me, grab me, I don't care, then right. you don't do it. So instead of always saying like, well, why did she do this? Well, why didn't he listen? Mm -hmm. How about that? Right. Why didn't he stop when she starts crying or she's screaming or why? Why is that okay? Right. And that's our society. That's just the sad part about our society. So, you know, it takes the Me Too movement. It takes people gathering together and saying, you know, We're going to be a light in the darkness somehow. We're going to make this different somehow. So, you know, there's a lot of groups in America that are making strides. Like I said, the last five years, it's different. And I will say, you know, there's certain people in, in, you know, political people that are very for, you know, trying to find resources for victims of sexual abuse. I mean, I think I don't care what party you go with. I I don't care. What, what, are, what are they preaching? What are they trying to get? How are they going to make the community any better? And that's something that I always look to, you know, are my representatives going to help people that have been victimized in the community in which they live in? Or are they just trying to make a big buck? Because it's easy to do. <laughs> you know? Oh, for sure. I mean, these people need to be held accountable and they don't need to be booked for 12 hours and then released back on the streets. Mm -hmm. And especially when you get with children pedophiles, it's known that for the most part, it's like a disease. They can't Mm -hmm. stop. They'll tell you, I can't stop. But yet we're going to be like, all right, here's your walking papers. And then the next thing you know, they did it again or it escalated. And now they did that. But then they also murdered the child. Right. It only escalates. So it's, when right. is enough enough? Well, and sadly, within the church, it's really bad because pedophiles know that they can go into the church and they can go sign up and be in the kids department and do what they're doing. And then when they get caught, they just go to another church. Yeah. And why one church doesn't talk to the other church, it's ridiculous. I mean... I'm not going to shame the Baptist, but I'm going to shame the Baptist. They are the second largest organization in America, and they are all connected. Why don't they have a system in place that every pedophile is flagged? They have that ability. They've had a lawyer come in there and even say something at the Southern Baptist Commission I think Vaz was there four or five years ago and he shamed them and um, they'll probably never ask him back to speak at the Southern Baptist committee, but you know what? He made a lot of pastors aware of their congregation, their organization refuses to help out women who've been victimized because they're just sweeping these pedophiles on from one church to the next. It's sad. I've had a lot of clergy abuse on my show, people who have been sexually assaulted, even as young children groomed, and then it becomes they're having an affair 
you know, they're the babysitter, but they're more than that. The wife doesn't know, but right. you know, and they think, oh, this man loves me and all that. But when they get busted, they just move them to another church. Mm -hmm. And half the time that other church is aware of it. But if that new priest is bringing in people from the streets, it's overlooked because look how many people we're getting. Mm -hmm. Okay. How many of them is he going to touch? How yep. many of those is he going to abuse? How many of those is he going to like ruin? You know, it's such a long road. That's a hard thing to deal with. Yeah. And you're and very lucky. And because some, they go to prostitution, mm -hmm. you know, because yep. sex is now, there's no feeling with it. Yep. It's tainted. Yep. And, you know, like, I would say it was probably after this, you know, growing up being molested and raped by the men in my house, then being in junior high and then high school and being raped by people within the, you know, the school system. I mean, there was a point in time where I was just like, okay, God, I guess this is my lot in life. Just I'm a sex toy for men, you know, and that, that's literally the mentality that I had because that was the thing that was so consistent. And, you know, it's very easy to fall into prostitution. Most of those women, though, that are in prostitution are more likely being sexually exploited. It's not like they're there because they need to make a living. Most of those women have been groomed by their pimp daddies and now they're owned. And so a lot of those women are there because of sexual ex exploitation, not because, you know, it's, it's, it's a sad thing. You know, they know the pimps know who to look for in society. They've done it so much that they can go to a mall and I mean, it's, it's crazy to think as a woman, well, I can't go to the mall as a sad woman, because honestly, as a pimp daddy, you could be groomed. Oh, well, this person's lonely. This person, nobody's going to miss this person. I don't know what the statistics in America is, but we have the worst system in America to actually um, register kids that are missing. We have a huge number of kids that go missing on a daily basis and they get sold into sex slavery. And a lot of those kids like America, like here in Texas, I know for a fact that little girls between the ages of nine and 12 will end up being kidnapped and sent on a container over to India where they will never see their parents again. But because the pimps and the people looking out know how to target little kids so well, a lot of times those parents don't ever go looking for them. So we have a huge, our statistics are so wrong for how many kids actually go missing because nobody's looking for them. If you're in the foster care system, the chances of you go, being exploited are so high. It's, it's just saddening, you know, but then... The flip side with India happens here. So we get America, Dallas gets the girls from India. And it's, you know, it's not the ghetto buying those girls. It's the rich people. And it's people you wouldn't ever expect because, you know, everybody thinks, oh, well, prostitution happens down in the ghetto or, oh, you've got to be by, you know, the, the club or wherever. But that's not that's not the case. Most sexual exploitation actually happens in the suburbs with the lawyer you would never suspect that you know oh, yeah. so know. many celebrities, politicians, I mean so many people have their handle in this because children are currency mm -hmm. and it's a lot of currency. Yeah. It's a billion dollar business, which makes me want to throw up. Oh, I know here in America, the Underground Railroad, which was huge back in the day. We all know about the Underground Railroad, but here in America, it is still used for sexual exploitation. That is not like closed down. It's still a thing. And it's absolutely saddening that so many people know that it's a thing and it's nobody, 
none of the politicians are trying to shut it down. None of the cops are trying to shut it down. It's like, who's getting paid to shut up? <laughs> Everybody. Money talks. <laughs> Sad. everybody <laughs> no it's very and you even have some circumstances that are even worse for the parents sell their children because mm -hmm. they want the money yeah like what are you doing yeah it's 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 a sad it's a sad world we live in but you know there is hope and there's resources for girls who want to go out there um i know the dallas area rape crisis center they will go into some of the strip bars and they will try to hand out their their business cards so that we could try to get them out of that world if they want to. So there's there's always resources. It doesn't matter what city you live in in America. There is a rape crisis center and there's there's ways you can always have an advocate come alongside you and they can show you how to live. You know, yes, you might live in a shelter for a couple of months, but who cares? You know, you, you're safe. you're safe. You can, you can change your life. You're not, nobody's, you know, there, there are a lot of things wrong with America, but there's a lot of things, right. <laughs> there are a lot of right things. So, you know, if somebody chooses, if somebody's listening to this podcast right now and they are being exploited, you know, there is a way out, you know, it might take a lot of bravery. You might be scared to death to get out, but there are, there are safe houses all across America and they're exactly that. They're safe houses. And nobody knows where they are unless you're in the program, you know. And um, so there's resources. There's always resources. Right. You just have to find them. I just wonder how many people have the means to do so. If you're constantly being watched or you're not allowed to have a phone or how do you find these resources? Right, right. I mean, there's... Most everybody has a phone those these days. So that's the nice thing is there's always a way to have privacy on your phone. Um, and even if you're constantly being, I mean, I've heard some crazy stories of how women have escaped the situations that they're in. And so if somebody is truly in that spot and they want to find freedom, they'll, they'll find it. They really will find it. But there's a lot of women that don't realize that there, there was a way out. You know, um, it just it just takes you being curious enough to go find those. I mean, if anybody were to ever go onto my website, um, stephaniejane.com backslash finding help or seek help. Sorry. Um, there's a list of it doesn't matter what state you live in. You can find you can find help. Um, and rain, rape, abuse, incest, national network. They oversee, they're the national network for all rape crisis. So every single rape crisis center in America is registered through rain. So anybody could go to rain and find help for sure. That's yes. the best, the best way to do it in America. Yeah. They have a lot of good resources. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. even an app for your phone. Mm-hmm. Well, there is, there is, you know, that's awesome. I do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even on my website, I have, yeah. you know, I have all the numbers. I just want people to find happiness, you know, like stop, stop living in fear. Stop giving your whole life to somebody who does not cherish it and just wants to make money off of you because you are worth so much more than that. Which is why I wrote my Fear Not For You a Redeemed book. Because there are so many people that are being controlled by the fear of, you know, even the fear of not knowing that you could do it different. You know, there's there's so much fear. And Satan loves to use fear in this world, you know. And God is a loving God who takes away all of our fear. But see, I spent seven years writing that book. There's a lot of theology behind fear. And I thought I was going to write the book and I thought I was going to be the most courageous Christian. And I was never going to be fearful about anything ever again. It sounds so good, doesn't it? Well, what, what happened? happened? <laughs> <laughs> and so I got really irritated with the Lord one day 
And I was like, you know what? I am having to face some giant fears in my life right now. And I've released the book and I'm supposed to be talking on this. And he said to me, Stephanie, you live in a fallen, broken world and you will always have to deal with your fear while you're on planet Earth. When you come to heaven, there will be no more fear. But there's, you know, 365 fear not verses in the Bible. That's not a coincidence. Hey, I'm Gina. And I'm Amber. And we're here to bring you the Weird True Crime Podcast, where we cover true crime cases that will leave you asking yourself, did that really happen? We'll dive into questionable cases throughout history that are solved, unsolved, or just plain unbelievable. We'll also talk about the quirkier side of true crime in episodes we like to call What the F*** Wednesday. So be sure to subscribe and listen on your favorite podcast service. Every single day we need to go to the Lord and we need to bring to him what our fear is so that he can make make us courageous in that moment to work through our fear. So the goal isn't necessarily to be completely fearless. The goal is to learn to work through your fear and take it to the Lord and trust what's going to happen. But it takes work for us to work through our fears. I've done so many things in the middle of fear. I used to not like talking in front of people. Like I'll talk all day long, but like, Oh, you want me to hold a microphone? I'm a singer. Like you want me to sing? No, you want me to talk. What? (laughs) I went up there anyway, even with my voice shaky and, and said what I was supposed to say. And it always touched somebody, you know, and now I'm in a place where I'm like, Oh, you want me to go up there? You got a microphone. I don't care anymore. But it's because I chose to work through those fears. You know, and when we choose to work through our fears, we get comfortable with that. And then then we have new fears to deal with. And that's how fear works. (laughs) We'll replace them with new ones. (laughs) They're more complicated. Isn't that better? Oh, yeah. Great. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. But, you know, God wants us to trust him on all levels (laughs) and he will test us on all levels. (laughs) I'm very dedicated to trying to live fearlessly for the Lord. Um, And so I don't have any shame taking my fear to the Lord. But, you know, women who've been sexually abused, they have a fear to put their heart into things because they don't want to get hurt. You know, they have the fear of trusting people because they've never been around anybody that's trustworthy. You know, they have the fear of, can I go somewhere and be safe? Because they're used to men coming upon them and doing unspeakable things to them. And so the community in which I minister to, they have a lot of real fears. Um, And I've walked through a lot of those real, real fears in my own path with the Lord and my own journey. And it's, it's okay to have fear. There's, you know, it's, it's okay to say, you know, I don't, I don't know why I don't like this. Uh, Maybe I should think about that a little bit longer because it's okay to think about things. It's, we don't have to come up with, we're in this like quick world where we're just make a decision figure it out, you know, but some things in life, we can't come up with a quick decision. You know, we need to think about things. We need to pray about things. And really we have to face our fears and and see sometimes we're fearful of something because we're believing a lie because this is what we were taught. Well, you were taught wrong. I don't care who your parents were. All of our parents taught us something incorrectly. I don't care if they were saints. <laughs> your parents got something wrong. And now you are so, you were psychologically damaged. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you're really not that off. I mean, I think we all have our own baggage, our own ticks, our own traumas, you know, Nobody in this life is like, I've had a fantastic life my entire life. It's It just doesn't exist. No, it doesn't. 
it's not a thing. It's not a thing. But Should be funny. So I grew up in a musical home and saw the whole danger of what music could do. Um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's it's the thing. And I grew up with some really awesome musicians, and I decided I wasn't going to do that. I mean, I just I could have done that, I suppose, but I was like, mm, I don't want to do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna go get married. I'm gonna go be a stay at home mom. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something different. That sounds safe. And um, I was probably 27 years old at my piano, just playing my piano and singing, doing my own thing. And God tapped me on my shoulder and he's like, did I give you this talent to entertain yourself? I thought I was doing the right thing by not being in the music world. Like, aren't you proud of me for like not going towards the sex, drugs and rock and roll Lord? Like, and he was like, "Mm, yeah, I need you to do a little more there. And I'm like, what do you want? Like, what do you want me to do? It's like, I want you to write your story. Like my story is ugly. Like you want me to write my story. Yep. I want you to write your story. So I wrote, um, see me change. And it is a, it's an album that walks you through my healing and God did an awesome job with it. Everybody on that album that I got to work with was just absolutely amazing. And they are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful pieces of music. And I love music because it goes out anything in media today, even like what we're doing today. Somebody in 10 years from now can come running by that some weird way and be like, that spoke to me. And it's cool because I get fan mail from that CD a couple of times every week. Like, oh my goodness. I've heard a story of a marriage that was rekindled because the husband accidentally walked out of the house with the wife's cell phone. And when he got into the car, my album was playing, you know, on, on her iPhone somehow. And he listened to the first song and he was like, I had to go all the way back to the first song. Like the first song he listened to was not the first song of the album. Right. But he heard it and he, he kind of got that I was a survivor of child sexual abuse from whatever I said in it. And so on his way to work, he listened to the whole album. He said he got to his parking lot at work and he had to finish out the album. He could not get in to work until it was done. He was like, I was gripped by it. He's like for 12 or 13 years, he's argued with his wife about why she couldn't do things, why he couldn't, um, why she wouldn't um, open up in certain ways with him. And he was like, for the first time I was able to understand my wife's point of view. He was like, I was literally about ready to sign divorce papers because I couldn't be married to her. She was so challenging and there were certain things that I just, I couldn't get. And he was like, I've now chosen to walk her healing out with her and I'm going to counseling with her. And I just want you to know that your album saved our marriage. And I'm like, that's awesome. (laughs) Wow. That's really cool. I love that about the media. So, you know, whatever I do, it's, it's an honor to be able to do this because it could be a decade from now that somebody's going to get something out of it. But, um, so God knew what he was doing when he told me to release the album, but I came here to Dallas with the album and I sent it to all the rape crisis centers here in the DFW. And there's like 20 of them. And one of the directors of one of the rape crisis centers had called me and we were on the phone for two hours that day, unplanned phone call. And at the end of that conversation, I agreed to go through the Texas Association Against Sexual Assaults Advocacy Program, which is an eight week program that you go Monday through Friday for four hours every day. So it's it's intense and you have to take test through the entire thing. And it is not open book. (laughs) You got to know the laws. You got to know everything. And um, so that began my advocacy um, here in the Dallas area. And I really started to get into the public awareness side of things. 
And that's when my public speaking really started, started off. And um, the next thing I know, churches were wanting me to come in and share my testimony of how the Lord's healed me from sexual abuse. And God has such a sense of humor because now I work ministry full time, sharing hope and healing through Jesus Christ is the name of my ministry. And there's so many pastors that are like, well, that's not a problem at our church. I'm like, mm, it is a problem at your church. 25% of the women in that church are being ignored by you. That's what's happening. And there's healing. You know, when we choose to go to the Lord and get healing, guess what? Our testimony is a whole lot stronger. <laughs> like, you want to you wanna create a great commission plan. There's no better commission plan than that. So please have me come into your church so I can go up there and say, you know what? It doesn't have to define you because there are times when we feel plagued by sexual abuse that we do feel like, how, what do, what do you mean? The, my whole life revolves around this. My depression revolves around this. My need to find things to make me feel better. And all of that feels like it's defining who you are. Well, it can define who you are for a point in time. Yes. But it doesn't have to define your whole 80 years on on planet Earth. It doesn't. There is a place where you can choose to do things different. And if you don't know how to choose to do things different, then call your rape crisis center and say, I just want to talk to an advocate. And they will help you find ways to get yourself in a safe spot and how to get yourself in a healthy community. And every rape crisis center has every single homeless shelter and all the different safe houses. They have so many resources that are not going to be available to you unless you make that phone call. So it's just, you know, like you said earlier, victims of any crime need to know that they're worthy of being able to go out and seek the help. But you have to want that. You have to want to do something different. Nobody's going to force you to heal. It's your personal choice. Do you want to figure out a way to do things better? Because there's a way to do things better. Are you going to invest in yourself? Or are you going to continue down the road you're in? But it's a choice, you know. And I chose to be healthy. Then. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm 46 years old. I still every now and again have a bad day where I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, I remember what happened to me at four years old. Never had that memory before. And, you know, it's like, I, that little girl that was four years old, she deserved somebody to mourn for a minute. She deserved somebody to be compassionate enough and go, that was a big deal, little girl. That was a big deal. What you went through that day was a big deal and nobody came to your rescue. And so I think as victims, as they go from the victim mentality to the survivor mentality, that's a big shift in their mind is they recognize that it's okay to go through the mourning process. You know, there's so many girls that lost their virginity through rape and sexual abuse. Did you mourn that? That's supposed to be a beautiful experience for somebody. And that was completely taken away from you, you know? And so that's just something when I'm talking to the girls here at the safe houses, it's like, are you allowing yourself to mourn? Don't be in a place where you're, well, I'm a big tough girl and I don't need to mourn. Well, mm, okay. (laughs) It is softening you up a lot. (laughs) Well, you do. <laughs> you have to feel if you want to heal. You got to put in the work. You've, unfortunately, and it's it's not going to be easy, and it's lifelong. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. It's never done. It'll never be done. But as long as you're doing your part, it will be easier, mm-hmm. and it will last longer in between episodes. I would like oh, to yeah. say. <laughs> oh yeah. And then, you know, the more you get used to the triggers, if you will, the the less impact they have on you. 
you know, at some point you're like, okay, my, all right. Well, oh, oh, I didn't know that before. That's interesting. You know, there are, there are days where it's like, okay, I'm now aware of that happening to me. Interesting. I think for me, one of the hardest things for me to have admitted through my healing process, like I always saw my mom being almost on the same level as me because she went through so much abuse too in the marriages. Um, so I just figured, well, she's a, she's a victim too, but I was her daughter. I was her responsibility. And, you know, as I got older, I'm like, you know, I did come to you and I did tell you what was happening and you responded. I know he's a bad guy, but he's not that bad. So there was a point in time where I had to come and say, you know what, mom, you know, I never put you in the abusive category, but what you chose to do was abusive. You allowed me to stay in an abusive home when you could have left, you could have listened to me. And then because of her alcoholism, there were so many nights I didn't get fed, you know, and I'm like, I was teaching a Bible study in a safe house and we were talking about neglect. And I'm like, I'm reading this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all this is me. Crap. (laughs) You're being the teacher. And I'm like, this is not, this is not good. And I admitted to the girls in the small group. I'm like, you know what? I just read this and I just recognize that I'm the little girl that they're talking about. And I'd never, I'd never put that on my mother. I'd never thought she was neglectful until I'm reading the psychological, this is what neglect from a parent looks like. Okay. Again, when you're in that environment for so long, it's normal. You don't know any different, which it's, that's one of the beautiful things about healing is when you get to that place of healing where you, you want to go through it, you start to admit, okay, these things happen to me. And then you can start to realize you it's almost like a Pandora's box. You've opened this up and now there's something else to open up. Well, there's another thing to open up, you know, but that's okay. Because every time you go a little bit deeper, you're getting more healing at a deeper level. And so that's okay. You know, there's a lot of girls that get frustrated, you know, am I ever going to get better? Yes. Yes, you will. (laughs) You will. I promise. Keep digging, keep digging, (laughs) keep doing what you need to do, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a friend, whether, you know, it's a small group, there's, there's a lot of small groups. You know, if you live in a large Metroplex, then you definitely, again, Call your rape crisis center. They're most likely going to know. There's a lot of uh, Mending the Soul is a really good, uh, MendingTheSoul.org. They do Bible studies in the churches, and they're all over the United States. They have small groups all over the the United States. And they go into churches and safe houses and people's bedrooms, living rooms, wherever they want to do it, you know. And um, they do online even. And small groups just specifically talking about the different types of abuse and it's written by two counselors for sexual abuse healing. So they know what they're talking about and they can help open your eyes to you were abused in certain ways. And it's important to acknowledge the way that you were abused because you can't heal unless you reveal I say that all the time to my girls, you have to be able to see it for what it is. Be honest. Absolutely. There's also a place in Arizona called Sapria and Mm. they do retreats Mm -hmm. for women who have been sexually assaulted. So I think that's great. Yeah, that is awesome. That's awesome. Because there's a lot, you know, like when you do, when you are doing a small group, you know, that, that in between time from one week to the next, it's so important to have other girls in your group, their phone number. So you can reach out because you don't want to go to a meeting and get like this download and they go home depressed. (laughs) 
that's not the goal either. <laughs> right. But it's important. What do I do with all this? <laughs> but when you have that community, it's so it's so vital to have that community and have other people. I had one lady. She sat in my small group. She was she was in a safe house, so she was required to be in the class. She sat there with her head down on a table for six weeks and wouldn't say a single thing. And then one day I said, does anybody in here feel like sharing their story? And she's just kind of, she just didn't even lift her head. She's, and I'm like, did you just raise your hand almost, sort of, kind of? And she was like, yeah, her head's still on the table, muffled, Yeah. I was like, well, if you're going to tell your story, you're going to have to put your head up because we can't hear you. So she finally sat up and she said her story, which she'd never told anybody before. And everybody came around her and was loving on her. And she was like, I just can't believe how good I feel. I had no idea it would feel so good to tell my story. And I'm like, that's the beauty of being in a small group around people that are safe. You can tell your story. And people are going to accept you and they're going to love on you right where you are. And she turned the corner. As soon as she told her story, she was all in. And it didn't matter what Bible study I was doing. She was there. She was awesome. And she graduated from that program and she got her kids back. It was awesome. And it all just, you know, I wouldn't say all stemmed, but that was a big turning point for her to, to share her story and, she she changed. She was completely different after she did because she mattered. It was the first time in her life she was like, oh, my story matters. You know, people. Can't. And it's a release. Like, let it out when you hold it in, especially like so long. It takes a toll on your health mm -hmm. and everything. It's not healthy by yeah. any means. No. I have so many guests on my show that keep it in for like 30 years. That's a huge burden to carry for that long. Like, yeah. no, you got to let it out. You got to deal with it. That's yeah. the only way you're going to be able to move on. Yep. Yep. It's vital. It's so vital, but you know, who's ever listening. I mean, you're so worth it to get yourself the help you need. And it doesn't take a ton of money. It doesn't take any money. Rape crisis centers are free and you can go in there and you can talk with advocates or you can make appointments with rape crisis counselors here in um, Texas. Uh, Texas A&M now has a teledoctor working for online rape crisis centers. So that's super mm -hmm. cool. So like if somebody had been sexually assaulted and they don't want to go to the hospital, they can call the teledoctor and they can tell you to go to a private lab and the lab's just going to draw the labs and nobody's going to know any different. So you can get forensic examinations more discreetly now. You know, not everybody wants to go to the hospital and deal with triage. Some days you might be sitting there for hours before and sad. the sad truth is you are the crime scene. And so the longer you sit there, your crime scene is diminishing. So it's really vital, you know, after you're sexually assaulted to, to go in and have a, a nurse give you the examination immediately. And if you go and you shower, then you've now washed everything away. That's the worst thing you could do is take a shower after you've been sexually assaulted. It's, you know, and I've known so many women that have gone through um, the sexual assault nurse examination and they have found, you know, the person that sexually assaulted them and they now serve time. But it's, it's, it's up to that person, you know, do you want to let that person go or do you want to seek justice? We have the court system in America and it's in place. If anybody wants to go out there and, you're putting yourself out there in a more uncomfortable situation after something extremely uncomfortable has happened. I get that. That's so challenging. I've, I've been bedside of so many women that have chosen to go into the hospital and they're choosing to have the forensic exam done on them. And 
I commend anybody who chooses to do that. But many times those rape crisis situations, they do get to seek justice when they choose to be brave and put themselves out there. Very important because if they did it to you, what makes you think they're not going to do it to somebody else? Mm -hmm. Here we have a mobile unit. So Mm -hmm. if you're sexually assaulted, we will come to you. Okay. And they'll actually do the exam in that mobile unit. Yeah. Amazing. And that's that's just like, that should be common knowledge for women because of the world we live in. All women should know where the rape crisis center is. All women should know, you know, like Collin County, um, just north of Dallas, has Courtney's safe place. So the rape crisis center has a hospital bed that you can go to 24 hours a day and have the examination done on you. And you'll have an advocate that will show up there and you'll have a police officer and the nurse will show up. And so there's no hospital at all. You just go there and it's done quickly. And so there are options throughout the country. Um, But again, we all have to know what resources are available in the county in which we live. And Texas is the only state in America that has a rape crisis center in every county. And there's a lot of counties in Texas, but we're the only one, the only one. So, I mean, you know, sure. New York has a lot of them, but what happens when you go to upstate New York, you might have to go further away. In the state of Texas, it's now required that every hospital has a SANES nurse, a sexual assault nurse examiner on staff. And that's only been in the last two years. That's Um, good, though. Yeah. I mean, you need that. You You need it. You never know what's going to come walking through that door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're all getting more counties are getting more resources, but it takes more women to say, you know, it happened to me. Because politicians who want to look the other way, they're like, well, that ain't happening. Nobody's talking about it. That's not happening. No, it's happening. (laughs) It's happening. So we need more people to say that it's happening to them, you know. Um, And I think, again, that all comes back to the healing. Because if you still haven't healed, you're still living in that shame. And you're not ready to go out there and go, well, it happened to me. But when people choose to heal the shame seems to dissipate and they're more willing to go out into the public and say, we need to do something different. We need to make this a public, you know, we need to make an awareness to this, you know, so the public knows. I talk about women all day long because I'm in women's ministry, but one in 33 men have been sexually assaulted. It's, it's not just a woman's issue. There's a lot of little boys, and I think there's so much shame involved with the male population that has been sexually assaulted because it's not supposed to happen to a man. That's another major stigma that we have in America. And they feel like it's taken away from their manliness, so they don't want to come out. They don't want to talk about it. but. I just recently knew somebody who passed away from rectal cancer and that was because he had been sexually assaulted so much that certain things had happened to him. And he's a big old black thug dude. It was like when he, when we found out how he died and why he died, it was just, it was mind boggling. And he never told anybody, but one particular person. And after he had passed away, that one particular person was like, Everybody needs to know this because he had been assaulted so many times. Would have never guessed this man. Never. And he was yeah, I've had a few man. men on here that have been sexually assaulted. And I think if anything, they were ashamed, but they were also confused. Like, does this make me gay now? You know, they didn't understand that men can rape men. Right. Like they're, men rape men rape women. They don't rape men. Well, no. Everybody rapes everybody. <laughs> so exactly it doesn't matter. <laughs> yep. 
Yep. And there's a lot of women that rape little boys too, you know, and that's a sad reality. I mean, it's so vital that we know who's watching our children when we go out and have date nights and nights with girlfriends and all of that, because, you know, and then it's so important for little kids to know things like adults aren't going to tell you to keep a secret, especially the babysitter. Babysitters should never tell you to keep a secret. That's bottom line for a little kid, you know, and do you feel comfortable with the amount of touch they give you, you know, um, and kids need to be able to come to you and say, yeah, I wasn't really very comfortable with so-and-so wanting me to sit in their lap, you know? Um, so it's our responsibility as adults to teach children what's good touch and what's bad touch. You know, do you get any weird feelings? And as adults, it's our responsibility to know what to ask a kid because the kid's going to give you an, I'm fine. If you don't know the right question, you know, and, stopitnow.org they they do a lot of uh, prevention for child sexual abuse they're a fabulous organization and you can always go onto their website and they will give you questions if you're not sure what direct questions to ask your children go on to stopitnow.org and they will give you a list of questions they will give you ideas of what you should say to children as far as what's normal touch and what's uncomfortable touch. And it's important for kids to have those words, that verbiage in their mind. So when it does happen, the red flag goes off and go, yeah, I wasn't comfortable with that. I remember mom saying that I shouldn't feel this way when I'm around anybody. And so um, it is our responsibility as adults to be able to give the children the words they need to communicate because they don't know how to communicate sexual abuse to you. They don't. Exactly. You got to keep that line of communication open. Mm -hmm. So important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always talk to your kids about that stuff. And people are like, what's well, uncomfortable? Of course it's uncomfortable. It's going to be more uncomfortable if you find out that they were abused and you chose to be uncomfortable instead of say something. That's a shame. You know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that just went to a hundred real quick. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, is there anything else that you wanted to add before we wrap it up? You know, I just think that, you know, it's just, we're all responsible for our healing. And I think that if anybody's listening out there and they're in a place where they can't even understand how they could get to a place that would be better. My advice is to reach out to a rape crisis center and talk to whoever answers the phone is an advocate and they're going to advocate for you to get into a healthy place. And you might not know what to do, but they're trained to know what to do. And so it's okay to not have this a single answer. It might be okay not to have a single question that you just all you need to know is that you want to do something different. And if you've been sexually assaulted, call your rape, rape crisis center. And if you're not sure where to go for that, go to stephaniejane.com. Stephanie spelled with an F. And I can get you the resources that you need to find your local rape crisis center. I'm going to put the links in the show notes too. Cool. Perfect. So, Yes. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. This was a great conversation and much needed. Yes. I appreciate you allowing me to come and talk and advocate for people to get well. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me this week. If any of my episodes resonate with you, would you please make sure that you reach out to me? It's very important that I know the work that I'm doing is actually beneficial. And if you just find good value in these, please make sure that you subscribe, you're rating, and you're reviewing. Share it with your friends, especially if you know somebody could actually use this information in their own life. That's what these are here for. Keep finding strength. Until next time.